Okay, so welcome back, everybody. So today's episode will be demystifying the human psyche. We'll also be discussing the psychotic mind. We'll discuss psychiatry and the many misconceptions that are connected to both psychiatry, psychosis, and different treatments and remedies available for um, psychosis and mental health. Now, joining us to do so is our smart guest, Jerry Mazinski. And um, you can see another guest here with us, Anon, who's going to share his story. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome you both. Welcome back, Jerry and Anon. How are you both doing? Good. Thanks for having us. Doing very well, thank you. Okay, so um, to just lay the foundation, I'd like to invite Jerry to just, you know, Jerry, we have some listeners who still have a different mindset as to what psychiatry is, psychosis is. So just to lay the foundation um, with your background and your work, could you tell us how you define psychosis, um, the psychotic mind, and the misconceptions that are connected to it? And then I'll let you take the wheel. Well, that's a big order. <laughs> 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 well, psychosis, what they call is, uh, what, what schizophrenia means is split mind. So that's about the closest psychiatry has ever gotten to the real thing that what's actually happening. You know, um, it, it's a, what they consider it is a, a break from standard reality. You know, so you break away from the same reality that everybody else has, and you're experiencing a different reality. Now, psychiatry calls that psychosis. They call the symptoms of it hallucinations, and there's two kinds of hallucinations. There's audio hallucinations and visual hallucinations, right? both of which don't belong to the normal set of what we consider reality. Um, so what I found after graduate school, I went to work at one of the biggest psychiatric hospitals on the planet. <clears throat> there was close to 10,000 patients there when, when I got there. Uh, and it, nothing in my educational background appeared, prepared me for wh what I was getting into. I mean, I was fascinated with abnormal psychology. I loved it in, in graduate school. It was great. And I'm like, what causes all this? Because the DSM, their Bible of uh, mental illnesses, only describes mental illnesses. It doesn't say anything about what causes them. Uh, so, you know, I entered that hospital and ran into all kinds of different mental illnesses. But the most prevalent one that we could work with was schizophrenia, which is a form of psychosis. And the most prevalent was paranoid schizophrenia, where the person hears voices. Right? Now, what I thought coming out of graduate school was that the voices were like, what do you call it, word salad. You know, just you, they didn't make any sense. It was like babbling or something like that. Uh, that's not what I saw. Uh, I saw patients walking around having arguments with their voices having conversations with their voices, um, listening to their voices and getting in trouble. There was one lady that was uh, arguing with her voices that she didn't want to leave the hospital grounds and the voices were convincing her to, to leave the hospital. And she was walking off the hospital ground while she was arguing with her voices. So I'm like, you know, what, what are these things? And uh, I, I wasn't quite sure, and I, I didn't know what they were telling these patients, but I, what I did know is if they listened to them, they got into trouble. They, they either got into fights, or they, they did stupid stuff, or they attacked people, or they, they, they did crazy, crazy stuff. And there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between them listening to these things and their behavior. Okay. Uh, so I, st I started asking staff, well, what are, what are the voices? You know? And the, con the consistent answer was they're hallucinations. You know? And uh, there was no answer. They, they, they were, they were, what were they saying? What, what were they telling these patients? 
none of them were the least bit interested in what the voices were telling these patients. I mean, here, here they were for you know, decades working at the hospital. They had no curiosity about what the voices were telling these patients. And they didn't know. They just, they were taught in school to the, their hallucinations. And there was no evidence for that whatsoever, other than they looked like hallucinations. There wasn't any research on them. It was like you know, the gods of psychiatry, like the ancient Egyptian priests, just went, we hereby declare that these voices are hallucinations because we said so. There was no evidence other than they looked like hallucinations. They didn't make any sense. Uh, they told a person to do crazy stuff. And, and I never saw a psychiatrist ask what, what the voices were telling them. So nobody seemed to know what the voices were telling these people. So I started asking them. And I kept asking them and asking them, there's no shortage of schizophrenics at the state hospital. There are plenty, plenty to work with. So uh, it took me about a year to figure out how to talk to them because there, there is no benefit for a schizophrenic to tell anybody about their voices. They lose friends. They go, you're possessed. Their friends leave. They freak people out. Uh, they scare people with the voices. They tell their parents or their guardians and they're, they they go, well, we got to take you to a psychiatrist. Uh, they go to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says you're mentally ill. You have to take these, these toxic tranquilizers for the rest of your life. There is no cure. You know? so, and those, those medicines have awful side effects. So there's really no, no real benefit to the schizophrenic to tell people about the voices because they, it's always a bad scenario. So what I would do is I'd, I'd get piece by piece. It took me a year to get a couple of pieces. I was like, I would ask them, okay, I know this much about the voices. Can you tell me more? And they saw that I, well, first of all, they were afraid of psychologists and psychiatrists because our job technically was to keep an eye on them. And if they were getting out of line to turn them into psychiatry, who would drug them? All right. So they didn't trust either psychology or psychiatry. So they didn't want to talk to us about the voices. Um, when, when I had a, a handful of pieces, they saw that I was serious about wanting to know what these voices were. And they would tell me more. And they, each time I got a piece, it kind of increased my little bankroll of, of these traits that I was learning about these things. And these people would say, well, yeah, he's serious. You know, he wants to learn. He really wants to know what's going on. He's not like the rest of them that just want to drug us and that kind of stuff. So the more, the more questions I asked, the clearer it became that these voices were running patterns. Okay? And if they were running patterns, they couldn't be hallucinations. So that flew in the face of psychiatry. So it was pattern after pattern after pattern came up. By the time I was done at the end of uh, you know, my career, there were 23 patterns that we discovered. But the first I discovered was negativity. These things were, were consistently derogatory, insulting, abusive, destructive. And, and although they might come across like, hey, we're going to help you. We got special powers we can give you. Um, and, and try to make, they tried to get the trust of the patient. You know, it, once they did that, they just, they just ran rampant. They took over. So they would invariably turn on the patient and start attacking them once they got their once they got their trust and the and the patient started listening to them right mm -hmm. that was a consistent trait so i went why aren't they random like hallucinations i mean hallucinations are all over the place and <laughs> i've seen them several times working in the er and and uh, at the hospitals i worked at um, the hallucinations are all over the place they they're they're positive they're negative they're neutral they're just crazy they're all over the place. they're unpredictable this was predictable. Every single schizophrenic I talked to told me the hallucinations were neg negative and derogatory. What was it that held them on that path? Why didn't they go random like all other hallucinations? Why did the, what, there was some force holding them to that negative path where they, they didn't wander from that. They, they stayed there. So that got my curiosity up. Then maybe a year or two later, I had a, a patient come in and said, uh, told me, well, when I read the 23rd Psalm, the voices react like uh, uh, worms thrown on a hot frying pan. And I found that interesting. So I started asking them, 
you know, what happens when you go to church? Uh, and what happens when you pray? What happens when you read the Bible? Um, the voices reacted very negatively to anything religious. So <clears throat> what happened was if the voices were weak and the patient went to church, the voices would shut up. The voices were moderate strength and they went to church. They would start mocking the preacher, start getting louder and blocking out the, the patient from hearing what the preacher had to say. So they were interfering with whatever he was saying, uh, making fun of him and, and whatever. Now, if they were very strong, they would make it so painful that the patient had to jump up and run, actually run out of the church. They were driven out of the church. Okay. So I started handing out the 23rd Psalm and started asking these guys, how did your voices react to them? They consistently reacted negatively to the 23rd Psalm, to the 91st Psalm. They react negatively to the, the uh, Bible, to the person praying, to them wanting to read the Bible. Uh, it, it, was, it was like they were anti-religious. They wanted nothing to do with religion or spirituality or any kind of positive uh, spiritual practice. Then so, I was like, why would a hallucination be anti-religious? It just didn't make any sense. And this was consistent among them all. Now, you know, those of you listening to me, on my website at jerrymarsinski.com, there's a list of 23 of these patterns. You can see them for yourself. I'm only telling you the first few. Mm -hmm. It's not like they buried them in some uh, uh, biological uh, uh, chemical imbalance or, or genetics or uh, any other kind of crap. They're right there for you to see. <laughs> They're right there. You know, all you have to do is look at them. And you can, if you're wor working with schizophrenics or you have schizophrenic, you'll see that you ask them about these things, they'll tell you. It's right there. It's in the open. You know, these, pa these voices are running patterns. If they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations. The, I'm only going through the first four, but there's, there's a lot more. The next one I noticed is they foster and create negative emotion. All right? Once they get the person negative and fearful and anxious and, and guilty and paranoid, then their, their energetic level drops. And that happened time after time after time. There was like a one-to-one -one correlation between the voices attacking these people and their energetic level dropping down to nothing where they couldn't function. They couldn't even get out of bed. And there, it was like time after time after time. So it, it looked like these things were feeding off of these people because when the voices attacked after they were done, these people didn't have any energy left. It was gone. One guy told me it was, he felt like he was working in the, uh, out in the hot sun all day with a pickaxe when all he was doing was tossing and turning all night in his bed. This was consistent among hundreds of schizophrenics I talked to. After the voices attack, their energy level drops to nothing. They don't even realize it. They just feel bad. They, and the, the voices block them from understanding this also. So it's like uh, you, you ask them, you know, after the voices uh, uh, attack you, uh, w what's your energy doing? They say, well, I don't have any energy. And I go, well, where do you think your energy went? They go, well, I don't know. I said, well, you know, over, you, over the years you've had schizophrenia, you've been attacked thousands of times. And every time your, your energy level dropped, where do you think it goes? Well, I don't know. And, and I'd say, well, if you stuck your hand in a fire, a thousand times, and each time you were burned, what's burning you? They didn't have any trouble. Oh, it's a fire. <laughs> but then you say, okay, if, if you attack by the voices thousands of times, and each time your, your energy disappears, where do you think it goes? You know, some of them would go, the voices take it? But the, the rest, they couldn't get it. You know, they just, it, 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 they were being blocked from that, that knowledge. And indeed, yeah, the voices. The connection. Yeah. Yeah, they were not allowed to see the connection. Mm. Not that connection. They could see other connections. They couldn't see that one. And yeah. when I was working in the ER, and and like, what can I tell these people that would help them the most? If they did, I had to judge whether they would go tell somebody or something because psychiatry didn't want anything to do with spirituality or or you know the voices being spirits or anything. they they would gut you. You know, if they found out what I was doing, they would go. 
Um, I learned but that the hard. I wondered about that, Jerry, because psychiatrists, you know, some of them are also religious, but they don't want to, they don't see the correlation. I, I've never seen but a spiritual psychologist, it. psychiatrist. I, you know, they, they, they don't, they don't want to even look at any kind of spiritual anything. Yeah. You know, you for you and Anand, our, our guest here, you have a special connection. I want to invite you to share that. Well, uh, what, Anand, Anand contacted me saying that he had heard voices in the past, okay, and that he was willing to tell his story. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he'd, he'd been through, uh, you know, he was, he was locked on a uh, psych ward for, what, about a month? Yeah, every time Jerry goes into his experiences, like, I'm, I, my memory is just saying, yep, remember that, remember that, remember that, like talking about the patterns how these entities, they want you to isolate. They tend to attack during between like midnight and three or 4 a.m. They don't want yeah. you to get sleep. And uh, yeah, Jerry and I, I connected with Jerry probably about a little over two years ago. Just I saw the great work that he was doing out there, getting the message out that these are legitimate patterns, that there's something more to this than just what the uh, mental illness community is, the mainstream mental illness community is, is presenting. So I kind of, talked to Jerry. I showed him some receipts I had and like Jerry was screening me to make sure that I was legitimate and uh, kind of questioned me a little bit too and um, we felt like we were both seeing things the, the same way so we've kind of started uh, doing some of these podcasts to get the message out there that hey schizophrenia does not have to be a life sentence. There are alternative methods to curing the patient essentially without having to resort to long-term use of damaging drugs that, that totally destroy the brain in the long term. And those drugs do destroy the brain. You know, they, uh, psychiatry ha has pronounced, again, without any evidence that schizophrenia is due to a biochemical imbalance of the brain. You know, I want, I want to just kind of give people a, a, just an inkling of how deceptive psychiatry has been. And they, they've lied to the population for decades, okay? Mm -hmm. So this biochemical imbalance came about, it was not until the late 1980s, after the release of the landmark antidepressant Prozac, that the idea of a chemical imbalance hit the psychiatric mainstream. As psychiatrist Peter Brigham points out in his book, Toxic Psychiatry, the drug company Eli Lilly advanced the chemical imbalance theory as, mar as, a, as a marketing scheme to sell their drug Prozac. There was, of course, no demonstrable evidence showing that depressed patients had any imbalance, but Lilly ran with it. Long before psychiatrists and psychiatric patients alike came to identify with the idea that mental disorders are caused by a chemical imbalance. And they, they've, they've shown that there is no difference in serotonin levels in depressed patients either. So it's, the, the drug companies are saying, oh yeah, uh, their serotonin levels are down. So we're giving them a, uh, a serotonin blocker. So the serotonin builds up in their, in their nerves and there's plenty of serotonin. Yeah. It's a lie. It's a total lie. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies are doing it for profits. Uh, they, they're, in on, uh, they're in on almost every aspect of medicine. And now it's so blatant, you'd have to be deaf, blind, and dumb not to see it. I heard the same thing back in 1990 when I was in the psychiatric hospital that, oh, your brain chemistry is off. You have to get it. We have to return the balance of all the chemicals and everything. And having a scientific okay. rational mindset, I asked, well, what's the baseline supposed to be? You know, there should be some sort of range where it should be. I got blank stares. Nobody could answer that question. It's just they kind of just skipped right over it when I asked, well, what, what is the baseline? What's, what's the charts? What, where's the data that shows what the baseline is? They, they, they couldn't respond to that. A question because they they've been taught that oh we're, the pharmaceutical industry is basically resetting the brain chemistry, but what is the brain chemistry supposed to be that they're resetting it to? Nobody has answers to that. No, oh, they didn't know. They don't know yeah, what the what, brain. And what had they tested to come up with this conclusion about the chem the the, the brain chemistry? What testing have they done to none. come up to come none. up with this? Zero. Absolutely none. Zero. Oh wow! It's total okay. marketing. Total total marketing uh, BS, I should say. It was a complete lie made up by Eli Lilly. And now they're teaching it in the universities. You know, they're teaching it in colleges. They're teaching it in medical schools. And it's a complete lie. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. Zero. And the reason is, is money. You know, the antidepressant market in the U.S. is expected to hit $15.98 billion by 2023. 
the, the global antipsychotic sales hit 14.54 billion. I'm talking billion dollars in 2021, and it's expected to reach 15.5 billion by 2022. These people care nothing except for the money. Okay, now uh, one of the uh, uh, Ronald Pye's professor of psychiatry, he says, I don't believe I've ever heard a knowledgeable, well-trained psychiatrist make such a preposterous claim that patients have a chemical imbalance in their brain, except to perhaps mock it. Mock it. In truth, chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists, but they're teaching it in the universities. They're teaching it in the medical schools. They've Drug companies are still putting it out in their advertisements. Like they change it a little bit. They go, it is believed that it's a biochemical imbalance. Before that, they were using uh, uh, genes, genetics. You know, so what they want to do is push it out of the purview of the, the, the population. So the population cannot see for themselves what's going on. So they did that with genetics saying, oh, it's a genetic imbalance. The geneticists finally proved there is no genetic marker for mental illness. So then they had to have some other explanation to make them look like they knew what they were doing. They came up with this chemical imbalance lie. Keep know? in mind, there's no, there's no money in the cure. The money's in treating the symptoms. That's so exactly right. The pharmaceutical industry is promoting these drugs for long-term use. That That's their objective. Now, granted, some of these drugs are good for short-term use because I think some Jerry mentioned there's some patients who would not have, have not been able to even reach if they were on some sort of medications for it. So for the short-term Yes, in short term, I would say maybe two years or less. It's the long term aspects that there are other ways to cure the patient without having to resort to a lifelong drug induced state of being on these tranquilizers, these psychotropic medicines. Right. Back back when I was uh, working in the yeah, 70s. But you used a very interesting word, Anna, and you called them tranquilizers. No, they're yeah, major, they're, they're, they're basically that's basically what, sorry, in my opinion, but, you know, they're basically what they are because i remember they're, being in the psychiatric ward and you're a guinea pig they don't know what drugs to give you to cure your situation so they just give you a whole bunch of different combination mixes and whichever one seems to work that's the one they go with but the problem is you may appear fine on the outside because you're tranquilized, but your mind is still dealing with these voices and the entities on the inside. It's almost like you're kind of still trapped on the inside dealing with the issues, mm -hmm. but they've just drugged you out with a tranquilizer, so you look calm on the outside. That's really, in my opinion, all that the, all that these drugs are doing. Yeah, and I, and I pretty much agree with that. They were, they were major tranquilizers, um, and, and what they do is they just calm the patient down, you know, so they make them easier to, to handle. Uh, they're not as violent. There's not as many fights. Um, and, you know, it's like when psychiatry saw that uh, phenothiazines were uh, available, that was like, they just latched onto it. You know, it's like, this is our purview. This is, this is our little area. They don't even like general practitioners prescribing psychiatric drugs, you know, because they said, well, we're the experts at it. And like, like Anand says, it, it's like a dartboard. They, it's subjective. They go, well, I think we'll start with this drug and that drug and this drug. And uh, what I noticed when I was at the state hospital, like Anand said, is they never gave any test ahead of time to find out what was out of balance or by how much. You know, and, and I asked them about it, and the, the psychiatrist says, well, we just trust the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies to tell us what, what drugs to use. And I'm like, what? You know, it's like... <laughs> What? You know, it's it's like letting the, the fox in the hen house. Uh, it, it was, so there is no test for a biological imbalance. They don't even know what the balance of the brain should be, the chemical balance of the brain should be, let alone a, a, what, what's out of balance. They have no idea. It's a complete lie. It's a fabrication. So what I'm trying to get at is, is how uh, slimy psychiatry is. I mean, they, they've brainwashed the entire planet and they're drugging everybody they possibly can. You, you go into a psychiatrist's office, you're not going to come out of there without some kind of prescription for some drug. I mean, it's drug, drug, drug. Uh, you know, it, it, and it, it, psychology is also involved with this, with their, their DSM. So they both use the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Okay? They said listing 
and it looks like a real scientific work. There's pattern, there's categories, there's numbers, there's there's sub numbers. I mean, you open it up and it looks like a real work of science, but it's 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 all made up. It's all it's all fabricated. There's not a single test, a, a single ob objective test for even one of those mental disorders in the DSM. Not even one. You know. So they tried to turn these into, uh, what are they called? Um, uh, well, they're used for insurance code purposes only, it seems to be. Well, they use it for that. They tried to turn them into diseases, you know, and the medical uh, establishment said, no, no, they're not, they don't even come near the description of diseases as we know them. So they were trying to make them diseases. And the, the rest of the medical establishment said, no, no, we don't want any part of that. So, <clears throat> what was the benefit in uh, using defining them or putting them in a category of a disease? Well, then, then they they would have the backing of the medical establishment. You know, it wouldn't just be psychiatry. So, because right now they're they're disorders or mental disorders or mental illnesses. They they don't have the same status as a physical illness like uh, an infection where you can give uh, the give the person a antibiotic and the infection disappears. Doesn't work that way with psychiatry. You know, you give people any psychotic drugs, it calms, it calms them down. But as soon as they go off of those drugs, the schizophrenia is right back in your face again. It doesn't cure anything. None of those psychiatric drugs cure anything. All they do is treat symptoms. You know, but people are so freaked out by these mental illnesses that they don't understand that the first thing they do is run to a psychiatrist. You know, oh, they know what's going on. No, they don't know what's going on. They know how to treat the symptoms. That's it. They don't know how to treat the causes at all. Yeah, and I think you're right about that because we see a lot of stigma, you know, when it comes to mental health, especially, you know, to the level of schizophrenia and, you know, the 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 degrees in which you work with. And I think this is what makes people, you know, when, when you have already stigmatized something, it's already put a kind of like an undertone, a little buffer in asking questions and digging deep because you're already not comfortable talking about it. So how can you ask all the questions? You're just ready to accept anything, like just fix it already. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the society is uh, uh, programmed to go, well, we want an instant cure. You know, mm. we, we want we want to take a pill and fix this. Psychiatry has plenty of pills, but they're not fixing anything. You know? And like like Anand said, they, uh, they it's like a, a guessing game what to start with, and they'll increase the dosage and decrease the dosage, and then tr add different pills, and then add more pills, and then take pills away. And and I've seen some patients with you know they they have a cup full of pills. I mean, they're taking like dozens of pills, yeah, you know? and they're walking around like like zombies, you know. So uh, this is just part of the deception of psychiatry, and, and it goes on with their, their diagnostic and statistical manual, which looks like a work of science. But the, every, there's, every single one of those disorders have been completely made up. They're, they, they don't exist like a, an infection. You can see an infection. These are all made up. They give them numbers. They give them descriptions. So when you, they're, they're like, a normal uh, span of behavior and cut up into sections and sections are pathologized, okay? So everybody has some of these symptoms. It's the extent to which they have them that becomes uh, makes them dysfunctional. Yeah, I think so, the problem with the DSM is it tries to cut, slice it into individual categories. And I found my experience with mental illness is that's not how it works. You you can have a little bit of bipolar going. You have a yeah. little bit of manic depressive going. You can have a little bit of schizophrenia go, going on. And we all as individuals have these minor symptoms, but they're below a certain threshold where we can function just fine in our lives. It's when these symptoms or the pathology of it starts to go above a certain threshold where we can't function properly in life, that's where it becomes problematic. See, and I ran into that studying abnormal psychology. It's like, well, well I got that, and I got that, I got symptoms of that, and I got symptoms of that. Every abnormal psychology student starts thinking, oh my gosh, I think, I'm, I, think I, I am this. <laughs> I did, I mean, because I saw those, you know, it wasn't major, but they was there, it was noticeable. <laughs> You know, so what they did, they fabricated this. They use it, like Anand said, for insurance purposes, 
because they have to have some kind of diagnosis. And yeah, that's course, what I always wondered about because these names are invented and yes. I know that they don't, okay, please people take this with a lot of discernment what I'm about to say, but they don't mean a lot. They don't mean anything because when you, um, when you go to alternative naturopaths, alternative methods of treatment or homeopathic treatments, they don't use any of these diagnoses. They just want to understand the body. So you can go with all kinds of symptoms, but they just want to know how did you get there, you know? And that's what I find so interesting. No matter whether you have, um, you know, a tumor or whatever, they just want to know how did this form, you know? And they're not looking at where the tumor is. Sometimes they're looking somewhere else, at the blood, at the your environmental factors, mold, even mold in the house. It could be anything. They want to understand your whole environment holistically, you know? And so, you know, over time I got to realize that what do these names mean? What is cancer? What is bipolar? What is this? You know, cause it's foreign to alternative. They don't use these words. I, I just learned that, you know, over time, but you can talk about this cause you know, it's your profession. Maybe <laughs> you can help us yeah. understand how these well, definitions like, are formed. Like Anand says, these are just labels and, and they're, they're fairly destructive labels too. You know, you get labeled schizophrenic. That's a that's a major diagnosis. Oh yeah, I, and felt, what like they, I, I felt like I had a high behavior. I could never revealed that I had schizophrenia. And I, nobody ever told me that it would be a life sentence for me that I couldn't be cured for. It. Maybe that's why I was able to yeah. surpass it because I was never told that you'll never recover from this. Yeah, and see, that's the other diabolical th thing with it. It's like you, you go in there and and, the, and a lot of psychiatrists will say, "Well, there's no cure for it." Oh, you know, somebody actually this used is a life words? sentence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I've, I've, I've seen them several times. They go, this is a life sentence. You're going to, the only thing you can do is take these drugs for the rest of your life and, and keep paying us. You know, and, and those drugs are extremely expensive. They're close to $1,000 a month. You know, the people oh. who are suffering from this, they can't afford that stuff. You know, and you go across the border to Mexico, you get those same drugs for $75 for the same amount made by the same companies. So the, the pharmaceutical industry is ripping off, you know, Western countries because they can afford to pay for these. You know, mm -hmm. if they weren't making a profit at $75 selling them in Mexico, they wouldn't be selling them there. You know. So what they have is a list of almost 300 of these mental illnesses right now, 296, I believe, all of them fabricated. In 1952, there, was, there were only 106. 1980, there were 256. You know, now there's 297. Right? And two-thirds of the psychiatrists on the board responsible for making up these psychiatric disorders are, are in league with psychiatry, with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Two-thirds. So here, here's a, a statement by a, a psychiatrist. He says, every mental disorder in the DSM is defined by a list of behavioral symptoms that committees of psychiatrists have debated and decided which clusters of symptoms add up to, to which labels and mental disorders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not one of the 297 yes. mental disorders has a defining diagnostic lab test. Not one. There's no blood test. There's no lab test. There's no x-rays. These are just classes of behaviors. Voted yeah, in know. and voted out. Mm -hmm. They vote them in. You know, you know hey, I got a new mental disorder. So they make them up every, every three years. There's new mental disorders coming in. You know, and they, they're ridiculous. I mean, here's some of the ones they have in the DSM. Mathematics disorder. If you don't like math, you got a mathematics disorder. That's me. <laughs> Caffeine intoxication <laughs> disorder. You drink too much coffee. You're disordered. You're psychiatrically disordered. That's probably the whole of Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> sibling, sibling relational disorder. I just drink it like it's water. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they, they got a disorder, according to psychiatry. Sibling relational disorder. Kids fighting, they're disordered. You know, Florence syndrome, being overwhelmed by beauty, such as in Florence, Italy. Feigning, it's marked by symptoms of feigning, dizziness, uh, and disorientation. Their, their recommended treatment is antidepressants. Drugs again. Drugs again. Paris syndrome, 
mostly Japanese patients visiting France. Symptoms include depression, anxiety, feelings of persecution. Uh, and earlier, we would have called that cultural shock, you know? There's Jerusalem syndrome, too, I think. I've heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, there was a Jerusalem the French, syndrome. French really look at their hospitality. <laughs> you know, They're and, causing people <laughs> to get shocked. They don't, you know, they don't care. They want to give these drugs to whoever will take them. Right now, there's more than, and this was, this is like 10 years old, this, this information. More than 7.2 million kids are on psychiatric drugs. How Over many? 7.2 million kids, and that's just in the U.S. Right? Wow. That's just in the U.S. So, uh, over 622,000 children under the age of five are on ADHD drugs, all right, oh. 80, 80, over 80,000. This is amphetamine that they're feeding these kids. You know, it causes long-term, it causes memory problems. Over 38,000 kids are on antidepressants. Over 85,000, now these 85,000 on antipsychotic drugs. These are the same drugs that Anand took, you know. They're major tranquilizers. They do brain damage. They physiologically damage the neurological system. You know, over 389,000 are on anti-anxiety drugs. They're just drugging these kids. This is, this is not a good thing. That is a lot. Those are some really serious numbers. I don't know if it's the same in Europe over here, you know, because I, I just started hearing the ADHD thing uh, maybe five, six years ago. That's when I started to see it, you know, the, the increase in that. But before that, you hardly found or heard of anybody um, talking about ADHD over here. Now, yeah. you know, I might be very wrong, you know, because I'm just, this is based on my observation, you know. So I think I'm very shocked by those numbers. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, look yeah, at the, look, we look at the results, right? Now, this is for the U.S., yeah, the U.S. Every, wow. every, every year, fifty thousand people in the U.S. kill themselves. Fifty thousand. That's as much. Fifty thousand. That's as many that died in ten years to Vietnam War, and this is year after year after year, and it's increasing. And this, this is, is from mental health psychosis. No, it's from from whatever. Just they just they kill themselves. But you know, there's got to be something in their head telling them to do that. Right? Mm. It it's not. It, it's yeah, not it's their talk so. because you you don't see it in the animal kingdom. Do you ever see fifty thousand lemons kill themselves, or fifty thousand uh, cows uh, all of a sudden decide to kill themselves? Animals don't kill themselves. We're the only race that kills ourselves. Why is that? Because we're hearing voices in our head that tell us to do that. You know, there's a thought before the action is taken, and those thoughts mm -hmm. come from what Anon is going to be talking about. And we got more psychiatrists, we got more psychologists, we got more psychiatric drugs on the planet now than we've ever had in the history of mankind, and we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. The psychiatric hospitals are full to overflowing, the prisons are full to overflowing. I give the psychiatry an F for what they're doing. Now, their meds are necessary in, in a lot of cases. They, they have their place, but their them. place is not everywhere. It's not everywhere, and it's not all the time forever. You know, there are new... Uh, therapeutic systems out there, the MACE energy method that actually gets to the cure of uh, a lot of mental disorders. Okay, Before you go to a psychiatrist, please visit you know, www.causismcausisminstitute.com. You can find a MACE therapist there who will help you out and will get rid of likely get rid of most of the problems you have without you taking drugs and it's a permanent cure you, know, you don't have to take any drugs and it's a lot cheaper than going to psychiatry so these voices that schizophrenics hear are not hallucinations you know they're not due to a chemical imbalance they're not due to genetics these are entities these are spiritual entities i've spoken to them they've threatened me uh, i can feel them uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to hundreds of inmates who had them. These things are not hallucinations, they're entities. So I'm going to let Anand talk and, and he will tell you his story. That I, I, you know, Instead of just taking it from me, Anand mm -hmm. went through this and came out the other end sane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
because he was aware. Ones. Yeah, he was aware of what these things were. He figured it out. Yeah. Good to pick you up in there. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so hopefully I can share my story to help others who are dealing with schizophrenia or have relatives or friends that are dealing with schizophrenia or even anybody who's starting to hear some negative voices or, or negative thoughts and other forms of mental illness may be related to these entities. So I had gone to college to get a degree in mechanical engineering and upon graduation, I had a little bit of time, I think I wanted to kind of determine what person I was going to become, what direction to head in life, trying to determine what, where I was going to go in the future. So I started to read the, the Bible a little bit to mm -hmm. just on my own. Like I wanted yeah. to re remove the middleman. I was raised, I was baptized Greek Orthodox. So I had exposure to some of the Greek Orthodox church's teachings. I attended a Methodist Sunday school throughout my elementary school years. And in high school, I was participating in a Roman Catholic youth group, even though I wasn't actually Roman Catholic. So I had exposure to some of the Christian ideas and I wasn't by any means a, a Bible thumper, as, as, as they say. I was more like I interpreted the scriptures as just learning to become a, a decent human being, uh, developing your consciousness and a sense of ethics and, and, and morality. And I never, you know, I, never, I wasn't into the occult or anything like that. I, you know, I've heard of demons in the Bible and in horror movies, but I never really took them that serious or anything like that. So I started to, to read the Bible, and you know, strange things started happening then. Um, it was at times I started to feel very euphoric, um, mm -hmm. almost Christ-like, and I didn't quite understand what to do with these sensations and feelings. You know, how to how to apply this. And other times later on in the ordeal, I started to feel like my self-worth was going to zero it's like something voices or very strong thoughts were kind of telling me that i was worthless give it up you're a failure in life you you don't deserve friends and i wasn't a loner by any means in high school i mean i had friends and people i associated with and everything else but it was like a whole bunch a whole bunch of different things started going on this is probably my, my mid-20s and it was weird because i had taken psychology courses in college. I, I took abnormal psychology actually as elective. So I was very aware of the various diagnoses, the DSM, bipolar, manic depressive, schizophrenia. And then I started encountering some of this stuff. And I said, wow, I said, I know my college textbook said one thing from the scientific approach, but this definitely feels like something's trying to take over my personality or, or, or my body at, at, at times. And what happened is I basically got to I was becoming very, very depressed. Uh, I was isolating myself, wasn't sleeping at night. And I just, I was crashing, basically. So I was being put on a low dose of lithium at, at first through a, a social program. My world was basically kind of falling apart. I, I was unemployed and a lot of, uh, there was kind of a lot of repressed childhood trauma that was frothing to the surface trauma that I never never really dealt with and I think that was coming up as well so so many things were going on simultaneously here and I ended up on the lithium there was a point in time where I my whole body started kind of kind of thrashing all over the place and my arms and legs were moving and I, I almost felt like something else was moving it like it wasn't myself that was moving it mm -hmm. and I was uh, sent to the ER room the emergency room of a hospital to see if this was something you know if i was had taken overdose of lithium if i was if it was a tumor or something like that so they did a bunch of tests uh to the mris and everything and concluded it was psychological not neurological or physical and i have to admit prior to that point i was i was so depressed i couldn't even think anymore like something was just dominating my thoughts I graduated with an engineering degree. I couldn't even add numbers at some points in time. My mind just was not functioning, like something was taking it over. I remember sometimes I would try and speak. I couldn't get my words out. Like I couldn't find the, the, the train of thought to, to even speak. So my words would kind of come out as, uh, and 
like something was fighting in, in my head back and forth like, like it definitely felt like an attempted possession at times so after the er visit i was voluntarily submitted into a psychiatric hospital there for about four weeks and as jerry said they don't know what 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 to, type of drugs to give you to prescribe you to get snap you out of it you're like a guinea pig they're just throwing darts i remember they gave me all different types of pills on different days some were oval shapes some were pink some were blue some were octagon sometimes they give you a combination of pills they'd switch it around based on what was occurring and they, they kept asking you are you hearing voices are you hearing voices and i would i was always always say yes but with the caveat that it's just my mind playing tricks on me you know i haven't been sleeping well and i'm kind of i'm not getting the right rem sleep or anything like that and i remember they kept asking what my name was throughout the entire ordeal and i was getting a little angry with this just because they have my file and charts there can't these doctors and staff remember what my name was and i realized mm -hmm. they weren't asking my name because they forgot they were asking my name all the time to make sure that i knew who i was and i always mm -hmm. I never just associated with who I was as far as the name of my birth certificate or anything like that. And these pills that they give you, I mean, they're they're not fun. They have some very nasty side effects. They're not the type of drugs you want to take it for recreational purposes by any means. I remember sometimes my mouth was so dry, I just cotton mouth for like three or four days. Sometimes you feel like you have like 80 pound weights on your feet. You could barely walk like you're in a zombie state. Uh, I remember sometimes I would look, change the direction of my view, and the scenes would shift to catch up to where I was looking. I would look back, and the scenes would shift to catch up. There was a few days in the psychiatric hospital I don't even remember, and I assume that was from the, from the drugs, just totally tranquilizing me. Where I, I had no idea what was going on. So I, I was going back and forth and dealing with these voices and very strong negative thoughts. Like I, I didn't, I was on the fence. It's like, are these my own thoughts, or are these something external actually coming in and attacking me? Coming from a, a rational, logical, scientific upbringing, I, I was on the fence. I didn't really know. I was in a state of cognitive dissonance because I couldn't quite tell. Sometimes I felt like, wow, this is a real spiritual, profound shamanic experience that I'm going through. And other times, I was, no, this is not. This is just my mind playing tricks on me. I, 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 See, this is something that, that has to be done by schizophrenics. They have to understand that those voices are not who they are. And, and Anon approached it very rationally and, and kind of got through it that way. But a lot of them think, well, that, that's me. That's who I am. And I've had prisoners who ask them, who are you? What are you? And the voices would say, we are you. They want the patient to believe that the thoughts that they're putting in their mind belong to them, and that's who they are. And psychiatry goes right along with that. Yeah, you're crazy. Your brain is broken. Those voices are you. We have to give you these drugs to, to do something with you. I mean, so they're, they're doing a disservice to these people. You know? but yeah. anybody who, any schizophrenic who's going to recover and is hearing voices has to understand that those voices they hear do not belong to them. If they don't understand that, they're never going to ever recover. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is so important, Jerry, and, and also Anand. You would not feed yourself. You'd not beat yourself over the head with negative words. Yes. That's so important what you keep saying. You would never do that. So this is a because I know the people were probably saying, how do you know the difference? You wouldn't want to speak. That negative speak, that negative talk, you right. wouldn't want to do that to yourself. Right. You know, people are, I think most human beings are built to feel good, you know, and you wouldn't be doing that constantly. That's just how I see it. But Anon, you wanted yeah. to say something. No, that's a yeah, good no, point. That's, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, and, like, and the intent of the voices, you, you look at their intent. Their intent is malicious to make yeah, you feel you bad. To yourself. No, you wouldn't do that to yourself normally. That's no. not you doing that. Yeah, the, I mean, when I was, when I was undergoing the, this condition, it was like, yeah, what? Well, I didn't know what my mind was doing. That, that, that's just what it comes down to. And these voices are very strong negative thoughts. I mean, they're, they're bullies. They gaslight you. They're saying everything they want, to, they can possibly to make you generate negative emotions. They want to keep you anxious in a state of anxiousness, uh, par paranoia. Um, they will distort your reality. They will actually use your, your memories against you. And sometimes they will 
make up memories and put it in your head to generate some sort of negative emotions or, or negative energies. And I think what it is, I think they're trying to amplify them. So if you have a little bit of negative thoughts, if they see a moment of opportunity, they'll go in there and try to amplify those negative thoughts, generate more and more of them. Yeah. And the model that I've approached is a lot of times people who end up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia have endured trauma in their life. It could be physical, sexual, psychological trauma. And so they may have what I call fissures or fractures in the psyche. And these fissures or fractures, this is how these entities try to get in. They're, they're entry points. And alcohol and some of the harder drugs out there like methamphetamines, if I said that correctly, meth, meth. <laughs> yeah, methamphetamines is the worst. It's like it just opens you up and says, come and get me. I mean, I've seen more prisoners go psychotic on uh, methamphetamine than any other drug. I mean, they, it just opens you up. I mean, they, they called the prisoners called it the devil's drug. Okay. And for that reason, and these voices are, con they're, they're consummate liars. They lie about everything. All they want to do is get the person upset so they can generate that negative emotional energy, that loosh that they then feed on. So they're actually feeding on these people. They feed on all of us. I mean, they, they hit us all. I mean, you, you can be they walking test along us. the side. They test yeah. everybody. Yep. They put a horrible negative thought in your head to see if you'll bite on it. Will you, re, what do you call it, remunerate on it? Just go over and over and over and over again. They have access to your memory. They can bring up every rotten thing you've ever done and say, look at what you did. You did this thing. You, you, you killed this bird. You did, the, you know, just throw it in your face until they can generate that negative emotional energy. So Guilt. Guilt's one of the things they feed off of, too. What you're Turn saying is so important, Joe. You guys are saying some. It's very important because... If, it, if they're doing, if the Anand, you said they test everybody. This is so important. And I think I'm seeing this as you're dropping um, remedies or ways for people to deal with, you know, to have early intervention, per se, you know, to, to, to nip it, you know, when once you're identified, you can just, you know, I don't know whether you, you know what I'm saying, because as you're describing that they target, they test everybody and they they will try and pull up this and pull this up. I see it also happening as a two way street, meaning like other people would also get the negative thoughts to harm others. And then these people will then get to experience some kind of trauma. You see, so it's kind of like what we're watching happen in the world is people are harming each other, creating trauma points. And then you called it fractures, right? So, you know, so it's, it's happening all around us. So somebody is creating fractures in somebody. And then now there's an opportunity there to now make this traumatized person, to hijack this traumatized person's mind and then just run with it. Am I, am I on the right track or am I going oh, no, to? No, you're on the right track. Well, I think you are. I yeah, you go back to the 50,000 people in the U.S. who kill themselves, and you go, well, what, what would these entities feed on once the person kills themselves? But then you look at the re result of that. You know, what happens to the family of somebody who commits suicide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like throwing a rock in the water and watching the ripples just go out. You know, so that death causes Thank untold yes, agony and yeah, yes. guilt and shame. And if I if I would have done this, he wouldn't have done that. Or I was a bad parent. Or you know, it just it, they win either way. These entities, they do not like humanity. I mean, they, no. they, they, they feed off of trauma. I mean, you know, the wars and stuff going on in the Middle East and, and the Ukraine. They're feeding off that stuff. Oh yeah, that's a that's a hog's trough for them. All the suffering and and wounded soldiers and. Uh, the trauma created out there, it, it's a hog's trough. They're, ju they're just, you know, I, th I think I read after over, over the last 2,000 years, there's only been 271 years of peace on this planet. So uh, going back to, mm -hmm. I was in the psychiatric hospital, mm -hmm. and I, I remember they give you all sorts of pills and drugs and nothing was snapping me out of it, as I said. Uh, and I, and I mentioned how they said, oh, it's, it's brain chemistry. I've heard them, they said there was genetics. Oh, it's, it's, it's due to the mother. I mean, I've heard, heard all those things. Oh, wow. And no, there, there, there's, there's something else going on here. So none of the pills were working. My health coverage was about to run out. I was in the final week there. 
they decide to resort to ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. That's where they actually will, will shock the brain. Now, this was done to me in 1990. So it wasn't as horrid to what Jerry probably witnessed uh, in, in, in the 80s and in the 70s. I almost fainted when I watched one at the state hospital. That's how horrible it was. And I got a pretty strong stomach. Uh, in my case, what they actually do is it's almost like being prepped for surgery. They have to give you a muscle relaxant because you can go into seizures, you can break ligaments and bones when they jolt the brain with, with the electricity. And they actually put you under the anesthesia at the same time. So you're kind of knocked out for it. The whole current might run what less, what was it, Jerry? about 30 seconds to a minute where they actually run the current? Yeah, it's, 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 I don't think it's a, a minute. It, it seemed like it was about maybe 30 seconds. It seemed like forever to me. And uh, most, of it, most of it's prep time with it. But anyhow, I have to admit, it helped me because after my very first treatment, I felt like myself again. I, I didn't have all these negative thoughts and ver negative voices in my head anymore. It's almost like prior to having the ECT, like the old vinyl records, like the needle was stuck in a groove. I couldn't get out of it. It was like the circle of negativity, negativity, negativity in, in my head. And what that ECT did, it seemed to reset myself a little bit. And prior to doing the ECT, I remember one of the nights in, in the hospital where those voices got so strong and so intense. I mean, I didn't sleep at all some nights. It was like a cacophony. Almost sounded like almost like being in a movie theater or at a, sh a show or a play before it starts. And everybody in the audience is talking back and forth to each other on their cell phones or, or their, their neighbors. It was all these voices, men, women, and children. And I, I felt like they, they, they were after me. And I just tried to ignore them. And these attacks continued. The, the, the negative, what these voices were saying to me and everything, you're, you're worthless, give it up. You're, you're evil. You're the devil. You're, you're no good. You're, you're a joke. You're a mockery to, to, to the world. And eventually it came down to like a council of maybe felt like there was only 12 voices, then eventually faded to seven voices. This all happened within about a 24-hour period. But I remember one of the final voices, when it was down to like a council of about seven or five, said very distinctively, what are we going to do about him what? in my head? And so I knew that the, I knew that they were talking about me. And things, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't letting him get to me. I was trying to like just block him off, block him off. And it was very, very difficult to, to do that. That reminds me of a patient where they, they were talking behind his, his back saying, uh, how should we kill him? You know, what, what, should we do it this way or should we do it that way? Or, you know, so they were, they're, they were telling, the, the patient was hearing this. Yeah. And again, like, I'm, li I'm lying here in a state of cognitive dissonance. It's like, what is going on here? Is this, is this my mind just playing tricks on me? I mean, I knew I was not in the right state of mind. I said, or is there something more profound going on? And I, I think part of my survival of getting through this was I almost had to go in a state of a split mind. One aspect of my mind was the victim or the target dealing with all this, the patient. The other half, kind of the scientific method, was the observer. I said, okay, you know, I, I'm kind of a scientist at heart. Let me, let me observe what's going on here. Let me observe what I'm experiencing and encountering here so, so that I, I can tr try and handle it. So they did the first ECT session, and in my case, it, it helped me. I mean, I, I felt whole again. I felt like I could start rebuilding myself as a human being. And keep in mind, the, the ECT, it's 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 electrical energy. It's not a pill. It's not a chemistry. It's like an electrical shock to the brain. And they insisted that I had to have at least a total of six ECT treatments. But I got to tell you, at the very first one, I felt like better, like I started rebuilding myself. I didn't feel any different af after going through five more ECT treatments than I did after the first one. But they insisted, okay. no, no, you have to do a total of six, six ECT treatments. So, so it's interesting that and I've watched that at the state hospital too. The voices would disappear for days or weeks after shock treatment. They did not like that shock treatment, but they eventually came back. You know, so it's interesting that the voices are energy. I mean, they're they're the electricity is energy. So here's energy affecting energy. I mean, now. And we What's also like are electrical beings. We have we're a lot electrical of beings. We're, we're mm -hmm. you know, are, we're, we're energetic beings. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Here, here's what psychiatry is doing is like, you know, you get a magnetic field. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. It's kind of like 
you know, normal people can't hear and see the voices and, and dumping antipsychotic drugs into a magnetic field and expecting that magnetic field to disappear. But no, this is physical stuff. It doesn't get rid of negative energetic beings, which is what these things are. They're energetic parasites. It affects the brain. It calms down the brain, which is like a radio receiver. You know, so it's picking up a certain frequency. You dump those drugs on there, it, it gums up the receiver and slows it down, but it doesn't cure anything because the cause is energetic. So I, I was essentially drawing upon my religious upbringing from a Judaic Christian perspective, the better aspects of those to, to kind of deal with this this situation and again i'm i'm going back and forth I, I wasn't quite sure what was going on so i was released from the hospital probably early fall of 1990 and the voices did come back probably about three months later as jerry said the ect treatment is temporary it, it may scald these entities for the short term but they tend to regroup and come back but this time the the, the attacks kind of changed now i felt like i was going through some sort of hierarchy and the initial things these voices started saying, this is probably about December of 1990, January 1991. They were kind of making me an, an offer. It's like they were going to give me a path to instantaneous wealth, fame, and, and, and power. But I had to kind of sell my soul to them. And I just didn't think it was coming from something that was beneficial or good. And they actually showed me how to get there. Now, I, I probably have to give up my some of my morality and my ethics to, to do so, but they, they showed me a path to pretty quickly achieving great wealth and fame and, uh, and power. And I said, I said no to it. And it, it was tough because I was unemployed at the time. My income that year was below poverty level. I had one, I ha fortunately, I had one credit card. And I was able to pay for my health insurance bills and my food and, and whatever rent I needed to, to by just using that one credit card. So I was, I was going to farther debt on this one credit card. But that's the only way I could survive because, because there was no other income coming in. And so these, these entity or whatever it was made me this offer. And I, I said, no, I don't want it. It was, it was very tempting. Hmm. And it, I don't think it was too happy that I, I didn't that I turned down the offer, but it's almost like a, a Faustian bargain it was it was offering me. Yeah, a similar thing happened to me. One uh, the voices and one client offered me a uh, lottery number, you know, and uh, I turned it down like like Anand did. I didn't want any part of what the, whatever they had to to give me. It just didn't seem like it was coming from a good means. That there's no, something nefarious no, behind something, it. Yeah, there's it just didn't feel good. <laughs> and uh, later yeah. on, I remember I was, I was offered the secrets of the universe. It was going to show me the, the codes of how the universe works and that sort of thing. And I, I, I kind of said no to that as well. I think I was more scared that I knew I was a human being, that I have my vulnerabilities and susceptibilities, and I didn't want that type of power or knowledge. I just I didn't think personally I would be able to handle it properly. I was still in my mid twenties. You know, the, the ego is still very strong then. I was still uh, into I wouldn't say materialism, but there was, I knew I hadn't developed maturely enough or had enough wisdom to be able to handle such powers and understanding. And I, I said, no, no to it. I, I said, yeah, hey, in a few Anna, they had some very high level knowledge, which means, you know what I mean? They have the keys, the universe, they know all this stuff. So that's quite telling, uh, you know, about what, you know, the level of, you know, of deception, you know, the, the layers. Of well, I've, I've seen them. I've I've seen them know stuff that they shouldn't have known because, they, you know, especially with meth addicts, um, they would they would tell these prisoners where to be and when to be there when they ran out of meth. They would tell them which houses to rob, generally where the loot was, if the people got up in the house, when to run, where to go to hide. I mean, it it was. The, the person himself didn't have that knowledge. And th there was one where they they told him to break into a house. He, he broke into the house. They told him generally where the loot was. The people got up. They told him that the people are up. You better get out of the house. So he got out of the house, and he was going to run down this one alley. And they told him, 
no, don't run down that. The cops are coming down that alley. Go down this way. There's a, a dumpster there. Go hide in the dumpster. So he went and he hid in the dumpster with what he'd stolen from the house. The cops went right by there, and they telling him, okay, now get out and run. And he said, well, the cop's right there. You know, they said, no, it doesn't matter. Get out and run. So he did. He came back to his apartment, and the voices were telling him, good job, good job. He said, no, not so good job. I left all the loot back in the dumpster. And they said, no big deal. Just go get it in the morning. So, so it seems they, like this is a big operation. You know, they're, they're responsible for the crime sector, the scientific sector, the cause to the universe, you know. I know I'm, I'm just trying to understand who these entities are because... They, they're, they're what they normally call the archons. But they're ancient. How do they have the keys well, to the are. universe? You know, the stuff Anon was talking about, you know, this is... It's, it's heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, heavy it's stuff. Not basic. It's not high school or, you know, the keys to the universe, the codes, and this is stuff that is not even taught in our schools, you know? Well, the, I mean? the other thing, you can't trust anything they say. Yeah, now, there yeah. Was, there was one patient where they told him, if you gouge out your eye, uh, we, we'll go away. We won't ever come back. So he went and did that. He actually gouged out his eye. They showed up and they started laughing and mocking him. Saying, look at you you're a fool you listen to us you're you're look how stupid you are now you're a freak people are going to see you as a freak for the rest of your life and it started mocking him so that's what these things are like you can't bullies. trust anything super they bullies say. and liars yeah. consummate liars they lie about everything all they want to do is upset you now so they yeah. upset that guy for the rest of his life now but They'll it was interesting feeding. anon they were willing to give you to trade your soul for whatever anything keys and whatever but again we know they're lies and tricksters but go ahead so well, there's, there's I just, a number of I just kept a, thinking who are they with this knowledge and why do they have it well, because there's, clearly there's a, a number of movie stars and musicians who have made that that trade and they did become famous and they admitted that yeah i gave my soul to the devil and and i got all this fame and money yeah, but I've always wondered, how do you give a soul? You know, you can't touch it, you can't see it. You know what I mean? I know this is well, a very... They don't crazy. give it, but what they can do is take it over. That's okay, their plan. So what they'll do, they'll push the person's personality out of the way, and they will take over. You know, and oh, when the, I, 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 have a, I have a poem written here, I can read at the end, from somebody who's in a maximum security block in seclusion right now. He... He killed three people and he cut his girlfriend up into little pieces and he wrote a poem about his um, his voices. So I can read that at the end so you see what happens when they really completely take somebody over. Yeah, but we see that also in courts, you know, when people, I, I, I remember back in the day when we used to see the court cases where people did some heinous crime, they always said, many of them said, I, I don't know, I, I don't remember. Right. And they don't. I, don't, I, I didn't do it. Yeah. It was so strange. But now in 2024, having this conversation, it makes sense, you know? Back then, they just looked like liars or, you know, having mental illness. But now it's beginning to make sense. It wasn't them, but maybe the influence. Right. So know? they have to lock them because since they, they can't get the, those entities out of them, they have to mm. lock them and the entities up. Yeah, they're, they're too far far gone. I've heard the term walk-ins, too. Uh, there's a mm. term that's out there where something can actually walk yeah. in and take over your personality, push your personality to the side, or, or move your soul over, or, or somehow mesh with you in a certain way, yeah. way That's too. usually an agreed-upon thing, from what I understand. It was supposed to have happened to uh, Lincoln in the last days of, uh, you know, he kind of, it was, it was supposed to, a walk-in was supposed to have taken him over and finished up. Oh, Abraham Lincoln? You're... Abraham Lincoln, yeah. Okay. Oh, interesting. Mm. Okay, and I'm sorry. But so, no, no, no problem. No, this is all, all you, interesting. You know, you're opening so many boxes. and you know, we're Yeah, it's, it's a lot of rabbit holes. A lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> okay. But it's informative, too. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if I was being tormented, tortured, going through some sort of testing trials tribulations initiations it, it was a whole mix of, of all the stuff going on and so it became like a series of different adversaries that i seemed to be encountering and i could tell they, they felt like they were different in the sense that their vocabulary were, would change and their intelligence level would change too as, as i was going through some sort of seemed like a managerial hierarchy 
Yeah, some of them are very sly, and some of them are very stupid. You know, there was one that just went, hey, 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 to the patient. The patient was wondering, does he mean, hey, me, or does he mean, hey, like the grass? <laughs> and some of them are really stupid. Some of them are very sly. I mean, just very, very sly. You know? But, you know, regardless, if you're hearing any type of voice in your head that you feel is not you, that's that creates a sense of anxiety and upset and, uh, I, I guess, you're in a elevated state and it's often negative too. Yeah. And you don't know what's going on. You know, it's like, uh, and, and you don't want to tell anybody. So I went through a series of trials and tribulations, adversaries. This is probably approaching spring of 19 win, win, winter, spring of 1991. And I remember one of them started or a group of them started kind of saying that, Humanity's a worthless species. They they shouldn't be allowed to exist. Um, they'll never learn. And I remember that I would actually see scenes flashing before my eyes, almost like a cinematography effect, like what being in a, in a theater with multiple screens. But it was showing me scenes of. The, the wars and battles throughout humanity's history and all the violence and everything and these voices would say see humanity will never learn they're just violent creatures that they'll never change they'll never mature and i started to argue against against these voices are very strong thoughts if nobody was around i would actually talk out loud to them if anybody was around me i'd, I'd just do it internally yeah I, t I saw that so many times and after i got out of the state hospital and cell phones came around and, you know, they have these buds in their ears. You can't tell the difference. I, I was freaked out. I still am freaked out. You know, it's like, oh, there's another one. You know, it's like, it was like an instinctual thing. It was like, oh, you know, it took me a while to kind Is that of. person schizophrenic just talking to someone? Yeah. I'm not sure. Because it was oh, just yeah. like the state oh, yeah. hospital, you know, where they, they're they carrying on these conversations with the voices. You're walking around like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, look exactly the same. It, it's, it's, it took full, me years to get over that. It's not word salad, as Jersey. These are full conversations. Oh, I know. With these I know. voices and entities. Yeah, people need to realize that they're full, coherent conversations. You know, they're not word salad. They're not garbage. They're they they have a a, a a method and an intent, and the intent is evil. It's not good tent, intent. So I started standing up to them. It's like, okay, they're telling me how horrible humanity is and don't deserve to exist. It's like I was being judged and humanity was being judged at the same time. And I almost like I felt like I was becoming like a defense attorney for humanity or a, a champion of, of sorts. But I started standing up to them, and I would say, yes, some human beings are awful, full of hatred and violence, but others are full of love and compassion. And I said to these entities or voices, I said, you don't condemn an entire species because of the actions of a few. So it was almost like I was facing this tri tribunal and arguing back and forth with them and trying to defend humanity against all their accusations of what they're saying. And I remember one of the later trials or tribulations, they start, would say how, you know, you human beings, you're just composed of blood flesh and bones when you die you get eaten by bacteria and worms you just rot in the grave there's nothing to your body or form it's awful they were basically mocking the human form and i started arguing back to them i said wait a second you can't put that on humanity i said our shape or form was given to us or granted to us or forced upon us by the divine hand that's something that, that, that god created us this way i said take your arguments to god not to me and it was interesting because this particular accusation, they backed off right away. This only went on for a couple of weeks where the other trials or tribulations or accusations or adversarial comments went on for months at a time. And I realized, wow, I can fight against these, these voices or entities. My, my, in other words, my case was so strong, my defense argument was so strong that they backed off right away. Because I realized they didn't have a case. You know, they, they were kind of going after the human form. And I said, wait a second. That's not humanity's thing. I said, you know, we're, we are who we are because of God. Don't, don't take this out on us. So this is an important point, too. You have to fight back against them. You can't just say, oh, I don't know what they are. or, or go. You have to fight back. You have to resist them. You know? Otherwise, will, they'll take that. It will take be tough over. at times. It will be yeah. tough because when oh, you start yeah, resisting they, them, yep, they're going to make it tough on you. They're going to attack even more because yes. it's like, uh-oh, this this target or victim is fighting back we we, we gotta 
we got to stop this. Right. No. So it'll it'll get worse once you start fighting back, but you have to. Right. It'll get worse, but in the long run, you will win. So the uh, and so I, I realized, oh, I have a chance against these things now. I, I'm in a broken state at this point in time because it's like you know, I'm not. As like I said, I'm still not sure what's going on here. I, I'm suicidal because the, the a lot these thoughts keep at you. Like they they wanted me to kill myself constantly throughout this whole ordeal of, of, of a couple years or so and they would actually tell me how to how to do it they would say sometimes you know climb a high voltage electrical tower and jump into the into the wires very very dramatic uh, way to kill oneself um, then they started just saying oh just do it with carbon monoxide poisoning and there were times i was actually getting out the duct tape and the pipes to connect to my car to, to kill myself in, 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 the, in the garage or, or, or a car and i think i had a higher thought that that that, that, that stopped me from doing it I think I had some younger nieces at the time, and I just realized if, if their uncle had killed themselves, it would have given them a permission slip to, for them to do, do as well. I was more thinking about them than myself there, and I think that's what kind of stopped me. But that's a positive emotion. It's, it's compassion, empathy for somebody else a little bit, too. And, and that's and kind virtually of was, all the schizophrenics I talked to, at some point, the voices would tell them to kill themselves. Just get it over with. Nobody loves you. Nobody likes you. You're worthless. Uh, you're you're causing everybody a lot of problems. Just kill yourself and get oh, yeah. it over with. I heard, heard all, all those all those thoughts, all those strong negative voices, all those things said. So it came down to. I mean, I was at, I was at rock bottom. I was in total state of despair. I was dealing with having the stigma of being diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder i'm wondering am i ever, ever going to be able to get my life back together am i, am I ever going to get these thoughts out of my head who's going to hire me i'm going to be in a state institution for the rest of my life and the final battle of tribulation that started to occur was something was telling me to god doesn't exist give it up your humanities and your religions are, are stupid they, they, they're, you're just material atoms there is nothing more than your body there is no soul there is no psyche or spirit it's all a bunch of bull malarkey in other words these very strong thoughts or negative voices or entities were trying to destroy any sense of faith that i had left within me and it was kind of my faith that was getting me through this stuff and i admit they, they were starting to diminish my faith i was losing my, my faith that there was god however we choose to define him, her, or it. And these voices started going after that. And I, I was I was starting to lose the battle. I was I was ready to, to give up. I was ready to kill myself and just say, I'm done with this. I, I can't deal with this anymore. <clears throat> this has been going on for over a year. Uh, uh, my, my mind is mad. I, I'm a lunatic. And here these voices were trying to tell me that God is dead. God doesn't exist. Give it up. No such what thing kind, as a soul. What, what kind of hallucination would do that? So finally, I was in a total. I was at rock bottom, to, as, as low as somebody could go. Total state of despair. I started praying to God. I said, "God, I said, give me a sign." I said, "I don't know if you're there or not. I'm dealing with this madness in my head. I don't know if it's something legitimate, more profound, or if it's just my mind playing tricks on me. I need a sign. I need to know that you're there." I need to know that this battle that I'm going through has legitimacy to it. I don't care what the sign was. I never said to God what the sign should be. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if a Bible had shown up in the mail by mistake, in my address, I would have accepted that. That's the sign. If a priest had knocked on my door, I would have accepted that as a sign. If I saw a rabbi walking down the street, that would have been good enough for me. I didn't say what the sign was going to be. So it was probably the most intense praying I ever did. Mm -hmm. did that for about two weeks and then something very profound happened I had a visual hallucination I like to refer to it as a vision mm -hmm. basically I woke up about two o'clock one morning with the feeling of an intense presence in my room now i can do a share screen and i can show a presentation of actually what it was that i encountered for you and your your audience sure so let me pull that up it shows the interior of a, of a room so this is the room yeah. that, that i was in at the time 
there's an entrance door closet to the right light switch on the wall there and there's a little like shelf that the jutting out from from the wall and this is the room that i grew up in. this is the room in my childhood that i grew up in so i mentioned i'd been enduring with schizophrenia for at least a year and a half or so now i'm being attacked by something that's telling me that god doesn't exist give up your faith it's just fairy tales make believe you human beings you have no soul you have no spirit you're just matter you're just atoms and i started praying to god give me a sign that that you exist i need to know that there's something more legitimate going on here that this is just madness in my head so i woke up with an feeling like there was something in my room looking around i'm not seeing anything so now i'm lying on my bed and i'm looking up and i can see the square light fixture is there above me can you all see the square ceiling light fixture mm -hmm. now that's the door it didn't switch to the to the uh, skylight fixture is it the square skylight right now no okay. no we have the doors okay I, I think it might, might take a while to catch up let's see if it changes on my screen, I have the square ceiling light fixture. No, it's not showing on ours. You okay. got the the light switch in the door. Okay, let me do something. There different. you go. Now you got it. Okay, I'll I'll do it this way. This seems to work better sometimes. Okay, so oh, I did it, but um, you can do it. <laughs> I'll just do it manually. That this will work just okay. fine. Yeah. So I'm lying on my bed, looking up. I see the square light ceiling fixture, and there's just a sense, a very strong sense, something's in the room with me. I don't know what it is but i felt this presence very ominous i don't you know it might have been evil i wasn't quite sure there but i just felt this energy that something's in the room with me and then all of a sudden i see this kind of s smoke seem to start coming in near the ceiling can you see a little bit of the smoke starting to form in the slide yeah, yeah. we see it okay mm -hmm. and more and more the smoke is coming into the room at first i thought it was an electrical fire occurring in the light fixture and i was ready, almost ready to run out of the room but then i realized wait a second that's not where the wires are in in the ceiling light and the smoke wasn't coming from the light fixture or the ceiling itself it was coming from a plane about six inches to a foot or two below the level of the ceiling and i'm watching more and more of this what looked like a fog a grayish smoke like cloud like substance it was kind of silverish grayish blackish coming into the room and it moved the way it didn't move like like smoke have you ever dropped food coloring in water mm -hmm. it kind of moved the way food coloring would move through a glass of water i don't know if it had sentience itself and i wasn't sure what was going on yet and it dawned on me oh great now i'm having a visual hallucination here it was i'm diagnosed with defective schizophrenic disorder or schizoaffective disorder and now i'm starting to have a visual hallucination i'm thinking great my schizophrenia is getting worse I, i'm i'm in bad shape here but the other part of me is saying okay let's see what a schizophrenic brain has to show it itself you know let, let's see where my schizophrenic mind goes what, what what is this hallucination going to be so that was the scientist in me that was the split mind the observer deciding to watch this whole thing so more and more of the smoke or fog or cloud-like essence is coming into the room and I, i'm more curious at this point i'm seeing okay where's this going to go i knew this is not normal reality where's this going to go more and more of this fog or cloud the clouds getting larger in the room and all of a sudden i start to see a kind of a portal or very dark opening in the middle of the cloud it was kind of oblong looking and i realized a lot of the smoke or fog is pouring out from the inside periphery of this opening the portal i could see the the, the cloud like substance pouring out from the inside circumference of this opening and filling up the room the portal's getting bigger and bigger or gateway and then all of a sudden i see two serpentine snake-like movements move from bottom to top within the portal it was very dark looking in the portal. I couldn't see anything else, but I saw these snake-like movements, very clear move. I was like, whoa, what is going on here? At first, I was like grateful that whatever this entity was with the snake-like tails, that it was on the other side of this portal. It wasn't in my room yet. That thought was premature. 
So I see, I'm watching this thing kind of move in the portal. It appeared to be two tails is what I saw at first, and then it appeared to be one tail. And more and more of the cloud is filling up the room. The portal gateway became obscured as the cloud is becoming thicker and thicker, but I knew the portal gate was still there. It's almost like seeing a full moon behind the clouds. I could see portions of it every once in a while. And I knew this is not normal reality, but I wanted to see where this all goes. Then all of a sudden I started seeing the serpentine movements or snake-like movements within the cloud itself. And I was like, oh great, this thing's in my room now. It's not just on the other side of the portal, it's actually entered into, into my room. I'm still not sure, I'm on the fence whether this was just a visual hallucination or if these things actually materialize within my room. I, I don't have any proof of its physicality, but I felt like these things had actually entered my room, that this wasn't just a visual hallucination. I still wasn't sure what it was or where it was going. So I'm watching the serpentine movements, and then all of a sudden, the serpentine movements are within the cloud itself, like, like something's building up here. I couldn't see any movements for a few moments, then all of a sudden, this creature pops out of the cloud and it had a mammalian head to it i know it seemed to disappear vaporize or pulverize see and that's one thing that schizophrenics have told me who are able to do this if they send these voices love it's like burning them with a blowtorch i've heard yeah that i think that's times. also uh sherry's um yeah you know, yeah yep, sherry, sherry also shared that with us and she also shared that's a live program and also yeah. the love uh, strategy to just you yeah, know. you can get you can get that that's a live program on my website at jerrymarzinski.com under articles. So if yeah. you're hearing voices or if you're hearing intrusive thoughts, just go get that 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 program off of there and put it to use, and it'll it'll help a lot. Yeah. So I did not expect to survive this ordeal. I mean, I really thought that was going to be the end of my existence. I thought this creature was going to devour me or my soul or, or something like that. And then I realized I'm, I'm still alive. And I could still see the ceiling light on my ceiling. So I, I knew I was still in the room. That was my data point. That was my constant. The cloud was still there. The portal was still there. Although the cloud was starting to dissipate slightly. I was thinking, okay, this I survived this. This ordeal's over. But I kind of spoke too soon on, on that. Next thing I know, there's a different entity hovering overhead this entity was more in the upper right hand corner of my of my field of vision whereas the previous serpentine entity with the lion like face had disappeared at about six o'clock or so this appeared about two or three o'clock this entity was very different though i drew it as a kind of a white porcelain mask i'm an engineer not an artist but this face was the most beautiful face i ever saw it was sheer undescribable beauty that i remember it was it seemed to be kind of illuminated and it had these bronzish wing-like discharges of energy coming from behind it it could have been three or four pairs of these i was interpreting them as wings but they almost also look like discharges of the like yellowish bronzish radiant energy almost like the corona of, a, of the sun or like solar flares and the wings are kind of hovering they're, they're moving back and forth sometimes it was over its face sometimes it was in different locations i was ready to get up and run out of the room again at this point because i'm thinking i'm a human being this entity is not of this realm this is something divine i didn't feel worthy to even look at its face it was so indescribably beautiful but i i kind of stayed there i was very humble by, by what i was seeing and I'm just looking at it. I didn't know what was going to happen next. I think the previous entity had turned into something very hideous looking. I felt this entity, which was had such extreme beauty, was going to do the same thing. I mean, after all, you know, I'm in the schizophrenic state. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure if I'm having just a visual hallucination or if this is a true visual vision occurring, a true paranormal experience of entities from other realms of existence. But I realized this entity, it wasn't aware of myself. Because I remember I was looking at it, but it's almost like it was not aware that I was there. It was not aware where itself was located. There was 
I think a few minutes went by when I'm just kind of looking, waiting to see what was going to happen next, watching these wings flutter back and forth in this entity hovering overhead. Now, this is something I came across in the last few years. Again, I had this vision back in 1991. There was no internet. I wasn't into the occult. I wasn't, I avoided any type of recreational drugs like alcohol or marijuana because I wanted to face this stuff head on throughout my entire experience of, with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. I wanted to get my brain back. And I hated to being on the low dose of clonopin that I was on at the time. I hated having to rely on any sorts of pharmaceutical medications to gain my standing and, and have my fa faculties in, in place. So I was trying to get off the medication. It was my, kind of my objective. But this is kind of what the face looked like when describing it. It was kind of white porcelain looking very, very beautiful. And the lower left-hand corner is referred to as a seraphim or sometimes a, a, a cherub, depending on what source you look at. But it's kind of a beautiful face. And then the, these kind of like wing-like looking appendages fluttering around it. And these entities are said to be very close to God in, in different biblical sources and other sources. I had no idea what this thing was. I mean, you know, if I was going to have a hallucination of, of an angel, I would think that I would see some, you know, beautiful woman with a halo over her head with, with wings flying around. I didn't know what this was. I wasn't aware of, of this sort of thing. So these are just some images kind of trying to represent what it is that I saw. Next thing I know, this entity opens its eyes. And it's looking at me. Now, I drew the eyes without pupils. There might have been pupils. It might have had pupils, but I just remember they were kind of very dark pupils. And we're just staring at each other. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. The cloud is dissipating. The wings are still fluttering back and forth. And we're just staring, staring, waiting to see what's going to occur. I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew this is not normal reality. I also knew who's going to believe me if I ever told anybody about this experience. I mean, you know, here I am diagnosed with schizophrenic affective disorder. Nobody's going to believe me. And then it seemed like several moments, and all of a sudden the face smiled at me. I could even see dimples forming in the face. And the face was rather androgynous looking, but I felt like this entity was of a, of a feminine nature. It was, it was a humanoid face, a very humanoid face. The, the cloud has dis, dissipated quite a bit at this point, but the portal's still there, or the gateway. And upon this entity smiling at me, it was a smile of grace. I just felt like, like waves of love, bliss, ecstasy come from this entity and enter my being. It was the most ecstatic experience I've ever had in my life. It's almost like it was letting me know that everything's okay. Um, I don't know if it was thanking me. I don't know if this entity had rescued me. I don't know if I had rescued it. I don't know if we've rescued each other. But I just knew that I was having feelings and sensations that I hadn't had for such a long time. Just floating in a sea of love, ecstasy, total bliss and joy. I started to have an out-of-body experience. I started to rise out of my body. And as I'm rising out of my body, I'm starting to merge with this entity. And this entity is kind of going back in reverse towards the portal where the other entity had come out of. And I'm merging with this entity in a state of total bliss and ecstasy. And just as I'm about to 100% merge with this entity, it's like we were becoming one being, being combined together. And just as I was about 100% merged with this entity and become one with it and cross over the threshold into this portal with it, everything went gray. It's like I was put back to sleep. And then everything went dark. Like I was deliberately put back to sleep. It was almost like, you know, when you go in for surgery and they give you anesthesia and they count, they say count down backwards, three, two, one, and then you're out. I felt myself just being put out. Wow. I woke up that morning and say a religious shock. It's like, what just I happened? bet you in shock. Yeah. What, what, That's what is, an understatement, though. <laughs> I'm a logical, rational, logical engineer with a scientific mind. Mm -hmm. But this was not, this, the scientific method cannot be applied to, to, to these things. The, this, I realized this was a true, profound spiritual experience. 
Now, the fact I've been praying to God to give me a sign, and this is what occurs. So previously, these, ent these negative entities were telling me that God doesn't exist. Give it up. Your faith is pointless. There's no such thing as a supreme conscious or anything above. You human beings are worthless. And then this is what happens. It basically negated everything those negative entities were telling me over the past months. This is the point I would say I cross over from having faith in God to Gnosis, having had that experience. Um, it was both ecstatic and terrifying at the same time, because this, you know, this is not normal reality. But th th it, was, it was the start of my recovery. I'd say this is the point where I crossed over from being a mad person and kind of becoming a mystic. I was able to confront the, the voices over the coming months and stand up to them, and they, they, they faded. They, they, they eventually faded over the coming months. They got less and less because it's kind of like you lost your power over me. You, you gave yourself away. You revealed yourself. Now, I don't know if both entities were evil. I don't know if the first one was evil and the second one was benevolent. I don't know if I had somehow trans changed that first entity of the snake-like body into the second entity. I don't believe so. I, I believe that they were two separate entities. Now, that second entity, there's many ways of interpreting this stuff. That could have been the Aeon Sophia herself, the Gnostics often talk about. Uh, it could have been my guardian angel. It could have been my own soul. It could have been my future self. Um, it could have been all of the above. But I felt like the second entity was something benevolent because it, it changed my perspective on things. I was able to deal with the negativity. I was able to deal with the voices after that. That Having that experience with the second entity, it gave me the will to live again. And I was able to rebuild myself as a human being and get, kind of get back, back on track in life. Now, I had no knowledge of Gnosticism, or I didn't know what this, this stuff was. And I was still in counseling at the time. I didn't tell my counselor about this hallucination that I had because one, I didn't want to be put on more harder, heavier duty antipsychotropic yeah. drugs. I didn't want to be put on more intense medications. My objective was to get off the medications to gain my own sanity back on to my own accord, my own methods. And the second reason was I didn't want her telling me it was just a hallucination and nothing more because that vision, it returned my faith. It gave me a basis to rebuild myself. It was the only thing holding me together at that point in time. It was it was a foundation from which I could start coming back into having a career, a life, having a sense of a future. And then about 2020, I start reading about doing some religious research, trying to try to investigate this stuff. And I really didn't tell anybody about this experience until th these more recent years. Because I had to kind of try to figure out some of the stuff on my uh, on my own, and I'm not 100% certain about all this stuff too. I have to keep a very open mind because there's multiple ways of interpreting this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I did come to the conclusion that as human beings, there's something very more, much more to just the material aspect of, of our body. We do seem to have a non-physical aspect to ourselves—a soul, a spirit, whatever one wants to call it. It restored my faith in God. As I said, it was actually, I no longer believe in God. I know there's a God. And I don't know if the most ultimate, highest essence of God, the Gnostic referred to it as the monad, allowed me to see this to, to help me to, to recover. Um, some, some aspects of, of God, uh, various Gnostic sects, will describe God as being undefinable, unknowable, unfathomable. Like God is just something that our ape-like brains just can't really comprehend. That's why we have to rely on, on the various emanations to, to interact with the divinity or the Godhead. The, the Gnostics refer to some of these as aeons and archons. Aeons being the, the, the better benevolent entities and archons being the negative malicious entities. You can call some of these negative entities demons. You can call them jinn. And I, I was expecting to have more of these hallucinations because I'm thinking my schizophrenia is getting worse. I never had a visual hallucination again in my life after that experience. So okay. it, was actually, it was actually the turning point of my recovery. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's rather mystical in a sense. Um, I was very fortunate to have had this experience, however terrifying and exhilarating it was. 
but just goes to show you those with diagnosed of having schizophrenia that there's something more profound going on it, it's a shamanic experience and this is coming from a logical rational scientific mind here but i i have to confess what what i went through and, and what occurred so schizophrenia does not have to be a life sentence there are ways to treat it than just relying on the medications it takes work you have to work on yourself you have to work on your psyche there's various programs out there such as the mace energy method there's the that's a lie program there's the better aspects of some of the religions out there you know there, there's so many different paths to the godhead and if you know if god has elements of femininity, elements of masculinity. It's definitely an infinite source, whatever it is. And I use the word it not out of disrespect. It's just I don't have another descriptive vocabulary word to use to, mm -hmm. to describe God. But if God yeah. is infinite source, the logic dictates that there would be infinite legitimate paths to accessing God. That it's not a finite amount of past so i mean christianity can be used to ask, access god um islam can be used to access god so the pagan religions can be used to access, access god there's multiple paths to the godhead i think the most important thing though is you have to be pure enough in terms of putting forth healthy love compassion forgiveness and gratitude to be able to interact with this essence of god however we choose to define him her or it and I, I found what these archons or these demons try to do is they're, they're very much into extremes, polarity. They're trying to polarize humanity. We have the extremes in politics going on. There, there, there's no room for middle ground. We have extremes of masculinity and extremes of femininity. And extremes are very toxic no matter what they are, whether it's extreme masculinity or extreme femininity, whether it's ex ex extreme left, liberal, extreme conservative, right wing. It's these extremes that are causing so much destructive destruction out there in the, the the reality that we live in and i believe that these archons or demons are trying to encourage those extremes because they they don't want humanity to prosper they don't want the vanity they don't want humanity to access access the divine sparks within the divin divinity within ourselves and after having this cosmic confrontation i've come to the conclusion that as human beings we do have a legitimate role to play in the cosmos. We're just not necessarily sure where we are. We seem to be part ape, part angel. You know, we have one foot in the material, physical world and another foot in the spiritual divine realms. But yeah, yeah. And I like that you mentioned the spiritual aspect of what schizophrenia, you know, in other medic, you know, in other alternative treatments, they don't have these names. They don't call them these names, you know, so it's very difficult, you know, when people, you know, hear, you know, these, you know, labels, but um, in different cultures, um, schizophrenia, the, the symptoms of the manifestation of what is called schizophrenia is usually seen as people with heightened spiritual abilities, actually. Yeah. They turn yeah. into shaman. In a lot of African cultures, if someone is, you know, not coping well with uh, their gifts, then, uh, you know, a healer or somebody who is more equipped will come and help you balance and navigate you and understand your gifting because it simply means and I'm oversimplifying uh, that you are able to see beyond other realms and you are able to communicate outside of these realms naturally, but you're not aware of it or you don't know how to navigate that space. So they don't call you crazy or sick or this. They just like, okay, we need to help you. You need understand. training. I needed training. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. They don't call you, oh, crazy. Now you know. No, they're like, okay, come on, you know, we need to help you understand your gifting. And most of these people are seen as healers and other things. There's a long list, but they're not seen as crazy. They're seen as having difficulty or a challenge in understanding their gifts and navigating this physical realm um, with those heightened abilities and gifts per se. So, oh yeah, I, I wish I knew of Carl Jung, and I wish I knew Gnosticism at the time, and I wish I had a good shamanic healer to help me through this when this was all occurring. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it would make things a heck of a lot easier. But I mean, I, I, I approached it head on. But th that's what gives it legitimacy too, because I wasn't, I wasn't coming from a spiritual aspect in terms of my background. I was a logical, rational, scientific engineer yeah. dealing with this stuff. So that should give it even more legitimacy 
to those that are listening that this stuff is it, demons and archons it's real it's yeah. very real, yeah, very I'm, real. I'm, I'm still searching truth I'm, I'm still trying to figure this stuff out i'm i'm a perpetual student i i definitely continue to dabble in the spiritual arts and mm. you know i know how much i don't know let's put it that way yeah don't we all <laughs> okay so i think this is a good place to end this um anan your story is it's fascinating it's um it's yeah I, I i cannot even start to imagine what you were going through during this experience observing all that how long did this uh happen how long was the well the last time i was on any medications for it was probably 1992 1993 but uh, the actual no, 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 i mean the vision when you are experiencing oh it's, it's you no know, it's, it's tough because time definitely feels like it's distorted when you're going undergoing these, yeah, these okay. sense of all the realities but i i would say I probably felt like 15 minutes wow. from start start to finish from and this 15 minutes that's from when the serpentine entity first entered the room i guess i can even say five to 15 minutes it, mm -hmm. I, it wasn't it wasn't an hour or anything like that because mm -hmm. i mean some stuff was happening pretty quickly but yeah i'd say between five to 15 minutes but from when the time that the uh serpentine entity kind of entered the room where the clouds started to, started to form if i was to put put a guess on it but I definitely know that the amount of time I spent with the beautiful porcelain face entity was much longer than the time I spent encountering the, er, the entity with the lion-like face and the serpentine body. Wow. Yeah. And I I if I may, so what got mm -hmm. me to this point and, and interacting with Jerry was I, I was doing a lot of search for religious truth and trying to understand things about how the, this world works, the multiple paths to the Godhead. So I, I wrote a book. Um, it's called Revelations oh, yeah, on Interstellar Highway 10. Mm -hmm. And I do have a website. It's asteroxrising.com. And I'll send you a link to that for the, for the show notes. But this, yes, please. Mm -hmm. it was the writing of this book that kind of helped me get to, get to this point. It was my search for truth. And it doesn't get specifically into my schizophrenic days, but there, there are some hidden messages just within it. But I think it'll help any seeker on their path to, to, to try and raise your conscience to higher state to try and have a little bit more illumination in, in one's life. And we've, yeah. we've got this one that Sherry yes. and I wrote. Yes. Okay. yes. If you're interested in how we came to the conclusion that these voices were uh, actual entities and not hallucinations, the, the path is in here. And I, I want to urge any of you who are thinking about taking psychiatric drugs who don't absolutely need it, to go to www.causisminstitute.com and find yourself a uh, causism practitioner there. They will get rid of the cause of your psychological problems in most cases. I mean, completely gone. It, it, they're not just treating the symptoms like psychiatry and psychology are. Yeah. And you know what I think, uh, Jerry, the biggest challenge we have today is people are just not aware at how much um, how many remedies and op options there are out there, you know, because we just thought there's just one way, you know, to treat something, but that's not the case. So maybe next time we'll talk about the mace treatment, you know, if you have time, because I think also there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say, um, you know, they think there's that woo stuff, you know, because we've been trained and programmed that they, this is it. It's the doctor, the pill, that's it. One way, linear. But there are other ways that work, and they're not woo woo. They do work, you know well, what they, I mean? Yeah, if, if yeah. it works, try it. And, you know, some, some methods will work for some people, not for others, but start at the lowest possible hierarchy. I think it's better to go and try it. The mace energy method before resorting to, to these destructive pills that just tranquilize the brain. I was start out at the lower echelons. You might be able to solve, resolve some of those issues and heal the trauma and get rid of any voices that you're hearing through a uh, least amount of having to destroy your brain, I guess. Yeah, with long term use, those antipsychotic drugs actually destroy your brain and your peripheral nervous system. They, they, they've done autopsies on psych patients in state hospitals and found their brains were shrunk like walnuts. And, and when they pr published that, the, the psychiatric mafia and big pharma went nuts and said, no, no, it's a, it's a schizophrenia did that. You know, but the researchers started feeding the, these drugs to monkeys and rats and, and the same effect happened. 
it actually destroys your central nervous system. So not only, only are they not curing anything, they're causing damage. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when you mentioned that um, in the first interview we had, Jerry, I looked that up. Everybody should look up that research of the brain and what the medicine uh, does to the brain. It's really, really eye-opening. You will think twice before you do that because they just it's all out there. Yeah, but when you mentioned that, I looked it up and yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah. We, all, okay. we also got, got on our website, uh, uh, again, at jerrymarzinski.com. Go to articles. There's the That's a Lie program that will help everybody. If they have intrusive thoughts, just put that program to use. Yeah. And I think people need to move away from, you know, the skepticism and, you know, without doing the research because there's enough evidence to a lot of the things we're talking about. You know, you just have to want to learn and, you know, find out. And um, yeah, and anyway, we have all built differently. So it's clear that there's no cookie cutter, you know? <laughs> you know, there's no one size fits all. So Jerry, I'd like you to have the last word and then I'll hand it over to Anon to have the last word as well before we head out. Yeah, just, uh, just understand that all thoughts that come into your mind don't belong to you. Manuel Swedenborg said, none of your thoughts belong to you. Your, your brain is like a radio receiver. It, it picks up the frequency that you're at. And the name of the game is to increase that frequency. And mm -hmm. like Anand said, it's through spiritual practice. I mean, you have to get on a positive spiritual path and stay there. I think if I were to say anything, it's just if anyone's dealing with schizophrenia themselves or has relatives or friends, the very first step to healing is to recognize that those negative voices, those negative thoughts, they're coming from outside external entities of you. It is not you. Right. Once the schizophrenic patient makes that determination, that's when the healing process begins. Because then they're able to say, okay, this is not my own mind. This is something else. I got to fight this. I can confront it. I can win this. Yeah, so you're not fighting against yourself. You know, like you have like an enemy within your own head. You, you have now identified an external enemy that you can fight against. You know, and psychiatry doesn't push that at all. It's like, yeah, your brain is broken, you're sick, you're, uh, you got to take drugs for the rest of your life. Uh, you're now a schizophrenic. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. It's a grave disservice to the human race. Yeah, it is. And we all know, Jerry Anand, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? So maybe we should look differently, you know, somewhere else. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. So to all our listeners, today's guests were Jerry Mazinski and Anon. These were our smart guests talking about a very important topic. All their information will be in the description. So make sure you take a peek, browse around, and I bet you will learn a lot. So I thank you all for stopping by. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you.